All right, folks, another edition here of Krantz's Corner. And like we've been doing this all week, and we've been talking about uh, a good friend of mine from college. I could even say that at this point. Uh, Udonis Haslam. Jersey's being retired this week by the Miami Heat organization. It's going to be a fun night. I'm going as a fan Friday night, no credential. I'm bringing my dad and my brother. I'm so excited. This is going to be a lot of fun. Andy Ellisberg is going to join me right now. Executive Vice President of Basketball Operations has been with the Heat forever. No better person to bring on today. Andy, thank you for your time. Thank you for making your debut in Krantz's Corner also. Uh, it's great to be on Krantz's Corner, and it's always great to talk about Udonis Haslam. I mean, right. he's one of our favorite people, so that uh, to be able to uh... – be able to watch this week and be able to see that, you know, as another, you know, kind of a piece of the legacy of what uh, Udonis has meant to the franchise and see his number retired. I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a really special week for all of us. Yeah, it is for fans, for everyone in the organization, for everyone around South Florida and any heat fan around the world. This is a big night for them as well. All right, let's start with this. Just like you said, how easy was this decision to make to retire Udonis's Jersey by Yourself, Pat, Mickey, the, all the all the, everyone in the upper management. This had to be just one of the no brainer decisions, right? This is one of those ones. I this is one of those decisions that there's not like a lot of conversation about. <laughs> it doesn't need to be a lot of conversation. There's not like, okay, you know, do you have a debate or a vote or this? It was sort of like it, it became one of those things you just were speaking into existence. Where when is the ceremony going to be? We're going to be retiring the number. There is no one else who should be wearing that number. That number. That number is retired. That number has been retired. That number was very, very clearly going to be retired. That was not going to be worn again. Right. Um, you know, he did it himself. I mean, the the play, the leadership, the character, it just became one of those things. It was uh, it was a when, not a do, <laughs> not, not right. are we. Right. I figured, I figured that was the no-brainer just kind of decision made by everybody. And I guess another one would be, when Udonis decided this was it after 20 years of being with the franchise to get him some in some capacity inside the organization, vice president of basketball development. I couldn't think of a better title for him and to be with the guys, to be with everyone upstairs, but to also be engulfed with the players too. And coach Spolstra. No question. It's always, it's always a, a, a interesting thing for when a player like him moves to that next level is what they want that next level to be. Um, cause there are lots of different roads to take. And I think they're mindful of how they begin that next life. Um, the thing about athletes that's unusual compared to everyone else, you could have an exceptionally long career as an athlete and you still have more than half of your life to live when right. it's over. And that's not really true about, you know, sports executives or broadcasters or coaches or actors or executives or teachers or people in a lot of different professions but you know when you if you have a 20-year career which is exceptionally long for an athlete you're in your 40s right. that's still a lot of life to live and so you gotta decide what the next path is what does you want to do you know how you want to be you know and for Udonis is said how much you want to be involved how much you want to spend your time with your family and so you know it really became for him trying to get a little lead from him is kind of how he wanted to do it and how he wanted to begin that sort of next step, recognizing that this may be the next step for now, when he right. may, you know, you know, may morph into different things going forward, and sort of taking the lead from him as to kind of how he wants to begin that next step. You know, when you're a player, and you you live under this life for the time and the schedule and the games and the next season and everything else, you know, sometimes I think when players leave, they want to say they want to step back from that a little bit. You know, his family has done incredible sacrifice. A lot of nights and weekends that he wasn't there. Lots of games right. that he didn't chance to, you know, for his sons and his, and his not even get a chance to go to. A lot of dinners missed. A lot of family events missed. Birthday parties. Lots of things missed. When you get out of it, and it, you may not necessarily want to miss all of them that way. And so you have to find kind of what the next way is. And you know, the one thing was very clear is you know, I want to stay involved. You know, he had his connections and the pieces to it, and I think the competitiveness and that piece to it. I think it was very important for him to to be involved and then just becomes finding what's the right path for him, which is may not be the right path for someone else. I mean, right. we have a number of guys, players, former players who have been who are part of the organization, obviously Alonzo and John Crotty and Keith Askins. I mean, there's, you know, there's a number of players, who, you know, Karan Butler and Malik Allen who have kind of made the move into the next phase of it. They've all had different paths. They've all done it different ways. Um, so you have to find the way that's right for them. 
No, absolutely. And you never know where a guy wants to go or what's wants to do or how much he wants to be involved, like you said. And Udonis to me, I mean, he's just it's a lifer until until he can't do it and can't walk anymore. And even at that point, he probably still wheel around the arena uh to help out with what he can because he's just one of those guys. Uh and it has been forever, too. Like I like I said to Andy, I I've known him since uh probably 99 in college, you know, we used to play NBA 2K in the, in my apartment for like 20 bucks a match versus other people. Like it was, I've known him for a very long time. So seeing him, and that's what brings me to my next thing. I want to ask you 2003, 2004 training camp. When I walked in there, that was my first year. WQAM gave me the full season credential to cover the team. And I walk in and Dwayne Wade's Dwayne Wade's a rookie. I think Jerome Beasley was just drafted by the team also. And Udonis came over from France trying to look for a team. And I saw him in the locker room, and I, we were just so shocked to see each other because I was so happy to see him and so happy he was back here. And he was half the size he was when I last saw him in college. And he said the food stunk in France, and he really wanted to get in the better shape. And I laughed at him for it and this and that. Your impression of a young Udonis Haslam in 2003 when you first saw him, first saw work ethic, everything for a guy trying to make the team, not a first round pick or a second round pick or a guy you traded for guy is basically walking in, just trying to make the Miami heat. What was your first impressions of you, Donis? Well, he was one, he made an impression that said, this is somebody you need to grab onto. I mean, that's when you, when you have players walk into the gym, you know, there's a lot of players that come in and some you say, okay, that's an interesting guy. Let's keep an eye on them. Let's keep tabs on them. Some you say it may not be their time. And some you say, okay, this is one you have to keep. You know, I think the thing with with Udonis, you know, he was a guy that I think people didn't recognize because, you know, he would, didn't look like the same player he had. Right. Been. And when people looked at him in the gym, they were like, wait, who's this? <laughs> and he was on the verge of going to another team. Uh, I think he was scheduled to go to San Antonio, and we slightly dragooned him to sort of stay. And, you know, because he really wanted to be here. Right. And one of the things with Udonis that I think that people don't focus on he was the first really child of Miami to join the Heat. He was the first play player that was raised as a Heat fan. Right. You know, he was eight years old when the Heat started playing. He had a life, you know, so when we first started playing, you know, there's a lot of people who were, who were Heat fans who were, had been fans of other teams. Right. Because, you know, we were a new team, you know, and that coming in in, in, the, in the late 80s. And Udonis was that first generation of players who were born and raised Heat fans, grew up watching us play. And so for him, the opportunity to be with the Miami Heat, he wanted to be here. And so when we had the 50-50 opportunity, us versus San Antonio, he came on to us and it was just for us to make sure we didn't mess it up. And we kept him. And so <laughs> we've worked at each and at each of the point in times, we've worked to, to find ways to make sure he, he was here because, you know, he was here truly body and soul. Right. Yeah. I mean, this guy bleeds Miami Heat, bleeds the city of Miami, everything in general. He engulfs this entire kind of culture that we always talk about down here. Part of the reason why that word gets used so much is a guy like Udonis himself. I've heard Shaq on podcasts. I've heard Dwayne talk to the media. I've heard LeBron talk. I've heard all the guys that Udonis has played with, especially Mike Miller, who's played with him a couple times, talk about the fact that He's not only just a great teammate, but he's a great person in general, and he's great around the team, great around people, great around everything at this point. Do you have a Udonis story from all this time he's been around, something that maybe – not a personal one that you want to get into, but just something where it kind of – it kind of just – it bleeds Udonis when you tell this kind of a story that it would be something about him? Well, the thing with Udonis, I always the, – the story that I kind of – I kind of remember – was that, um, you know, what happened really in the Indiana series when um, when they hit Dwayne. Right. And that series was a very, you know, kind of physical series all year long. And we had said to the NBA, said, hey, you know, there's, you know, a problem here. You got to take a look at this. This is getting a little bit sideways. And sure enough, to the ser in those series, there's a bunch of times that the, the players ran up on us. And they're trying to sort of turn it into something a little bit more. And guys sort of try to avoid it because we were trying to win. And in that series, when you look back at the video of it, Udonis, they hit Dwayne. Right. And um, Hansborough and Lou Admonson do like a low five. Right. 
and you watch the tape of like Udonis looks at Dwayne, looks at the low five, looks at Dwayne bleeding, looks at the low five. And my understanding is he went back to the bench and Dwayne said, don't do anything. And Udonis <laughs> was like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, you know, two plays later, he lays out Hansborough. Right. And, you know, I had, um, you know, discussions with the NBA about it. And there was very much of like, you know, we don't accept frontier justice. And I said, look, here's the reality. We warned you about it. Right. You watched it happen. You watched these guys run up. You watched the technicals. Then this thing happened. If you don't do something about it, the players are going to do something about right. it. Right. Right. And sure enough, you Donis did something about it. And, you know, we would go back, we win the series. He's not able to play that game. And the players all took on themselves to grab the game ball and sign it and bring him. You know, he was on the plane waiting for us because we were going back to Miami if there had been a game seven, which there wasn't. Right. And they presented him the game ball, you know, because he had stood up for his teammates. And that's obviously the most obvious one. But, you know, I also go back to, um, you know, earlier in that Indiana, you know, in, in a game against Indiana when we played them and, you know, the, you know, we had lost to Dallas in the first year. So this is the second year of the big three. Right. And then we go to Indiana and Chris Bosch had gone down. We lose. We're down 2-1. And we're playing game four in Indiana. And this is one of those days where everyone, we kind of had an off day. Everyone kind of went there in their own way. I think Dwayne went to University of Indiana to go see Tom Green. Right. Guys went to movies. It was a little bit of a soul searching day because like you needed to win. And that game, we came back, we won game four, and it was three players that kind of really yet led the way. Two of them you would expect Dwayne, LeBron. Right. And the third one was Udonis. And big games, big moments, big times. You know, we play game six. He's defending Nowitzki. He's got a separated shoulder. I remember you're going back into the game, second half, of game six. And his shoulder separated. And I mentioned to someone he had a separate shoulder. And they said, well, is Udonis going to be able to play in the second half? And I kind of looked at them like, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> right. Good answer. Nice. Thing. Thank said, you for the PG-13 answer on that one. Right. Yeah. I said, was, I said, unless the shoulder has come off his body. <laughs> and even then, I'm not quite sure he's not going to say he can play. You're not getting Udonis out of this game. And, you know, he's been that way with everything. He's pure. He, it, it comes from a pure place in his heart of that. He is the guy you want to be in your foxhole with you. And he is going to be the guy that whether you win or lose, you don't know. Right. But he is going to be with you whether you win or lose. Mm -hmm. And that is who he is. He is that to the core. He believes in that. And he's been that really, you know, for his city for the Canes that he loves, for the Gators that he loves, for the Heat. You know, he has just been a all-in person who it is an absolute pure love that he has. Is he cantankerous? Yes. Is he grumpy at times? Yes. <laughs> is he going to be difficult at times? Sure. But it all comes from a place of absolute pure love. Right. I mean, you said it, you just really just said everything. If, if I could go back and replay interviews with some of his buddies, with his old coach, Frank Martin, with anyone, it's the same. It's like the same thing from everybody on Udonis. It's, so, it's amazing to hear that because then you could understand why he's such a genuine guy and why everyone thinks that uh, it, it just about him, about his aura, about everything around him. All right. Last one. And I'm going to let you go, Andy. Um, Culture only happens when you win. You can't have culture if you don't win. You know, you have to win. You have to be a good team. You have to go through adversity to get there. 2006 is when it happened, I think, for the Heat, where they won that first title with Shaq and that amazing team that was put together. Shaq still says, we wouldn't have won without Udonis. We wouldn't have won without this. I love when he says that kind of stuff. But 20 years later, that word is being overused by everybody. But I think it really, for us down here, anyone from South Florida, really started with that Heat team. Is there a better face when someone talks about heat culture or the culture of this team outside of Pat who came down here and changed everything for this organization and just changed the way we look at winning 
because Pat really oh. came down here and did that when he promised the the parade on Biscayne. I think we all jumped up and down hoping that that would happen, and he made it happen. But the culture thing started with the players and with Pat. Is there a better face, a better kind of when you talk about it than Udonis at this point? Look, Udonis is a pure face, a pure face of it, and the Heat culture. I actually had a beginning a little earlier. I have the, I have the Heat culture really beginning. If you look at the Alonzo Morning Tim Hardaway team, right? I'm with you that. Know, there's a that that team that didn't win a championship, but has been a part of all of our championships because they really established a blueprint for how we played and how we were as a team. And we've gotten more talented teams than maybe that team had. We've had guys who are able to maybe do a little bit more and they've had more success at what it is. But the foundation of how that team played and what that team believed has been there. And there are many, many culture carriers of that who have done that. Udonis is one of the you know, prime examples of it. Right. And one of the true, true ones of it. And people throw the word culture around a lot. And it's an easy word, a nice word to have. The reason why it resonates with us is because it's real and people believe it. Right. Whether we're right or wrong, that's for someone else to decide. But we all believe it. We, there's a reason, you know, the Miami Heat culture is, is something that, that we believe and the people believe it. And the reason it works, it has for it is because there's a belief in it. And we believe that there's something about the Miami Heat that is just special. And that the way we do things, and it's not for everyone. And I'm perfectly fine when people say, you know, that's not for me. And that's quite fine. And I think our fans are perfectly fine when people say it's not for us, or we don't believe it, or people dislike us, or people look, you know, question us. I think we're perfectly fine with that because we believe it. It's sincere to us. It, res it resonates in the players. It resonates in the coaching staff. It resonates in the staff of staff that works. It resonates to the people who come and work game nights. It resonates to the fans who come in the, in the games here in Miami. And it resonates to the fans throughout the world. They believe in it. And that's why it is successful, because it is something we truly believe. And Udonis is one of the most perfect examples of somebody who absolutely believes in the culture he absolutely loves the culture he lives and breathes and miami heat and there's no more fitting person who deserves to have his number retired and when that number 40 goes up to the rafters you know and that no one else will ever wear that number 40 and that kids 20 years from now 30 years from now 40 years from now 50 years from now are going to go and look up in those rafters and they're going to see that name and they're going to see that number and they're going to understand what he meant, what he meant to the city, what he meant to our team. And uh, I think we're all looking forward to that day on uh, Friday. And it's going to be a happy, proud day because um, we love you, D, and he deserves it. Andy, you summed it up so great. Uh, there's, I, I, I almost want to just cut that off and stop. Like, we're done, like, at that point, because it was just such a great answer for you on culture, on heat, on everything. And you're right. You don't have to be a part of the organization to be proud of what's happening down there. You could be just a super fan like myself who you're right. I still to this day, and, and I don't want you to comment because you might get in trouble. I still to this day can't see Alan Houston on TV or somewhere and not flick him off or do something because I just can't do that anymore because that's just me. I, I can't. Like my wife was with me once when I saw him and I embarrassed myself. But anyways, that's besides the point. That's where the look, culture, look, look, that's where look, the bleeding of the heat comes in me also. Well, luckily, I would say to you, you are part of the whole key culture. I am. The heat culture I am. is part of the, the fans and people that have been part of that are our part of the heart, part of the heat culture. And I'll tell you a funny story on Alan Houston. Yeah. So Alan was in basketball operations for a little while. When he made, first made the transaction, he kind of was in the you know in that group dealing with sort of the trades and things of like that. He's been involved in the organization for a lot, but not involved in that. Right. So now this is maybe eight, ten years after the shot when this happened that he had become part of that administration. So one day after a game, I'm, you know, I want to chalk and chatting to him because, you know, we have business, we have to talk right, about, you know, that's, you know, we have a basketball business to be, and I'd always had a good cordial relationship with Alan. So I, you know, although I will admit the first time I was able to watch that shot and not feel the bile in my stomach was, <laughs> was when it was, they showed it as part of the championship video in 2006. Right. So once we win the championship, I'm like, okay, now I can sort of watch that shot and not totally taste the bottle in my stomach. Right. So I went and I was chatting with Alan, you know, about some basketball stuff. 
And one of our reporters was in there staring at me. And when I, when Alan walks away, he walks up to me and goes, Judas. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> oh my God. I, I, I get, but I get it. I totally get it. Andy, if I saw that from the crowd, I would have been like, Andy Ellisberg, what is he doing? How is I he talking? To, I would have done the same thing. Uh, look, that's the beauty of sports. Right. There's a passion and things at sports. Um, and sports gets a lot of bad rap, so which it deserves. There's a lots of excesses and things we have and lots of things we do that we don't have great perspective on. Right. But one of the things sports does is unites people. People from all different course of life will unite on something. People who can't talk about many different things, fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, fathers and daughters, who can talk about sports. And they have that shared thing. And there are certain things that trigger it. Sometimes good. Sometimes bad. Ray Allen is good. Right. Allen Houston bad. bad. So we, you get you get both, and, and it's different for different people because the New York people love the Allen Houston, the San Antonio people not so much Ray Allen. So right. everyone has their different things that affect and trigger them. So, um, you know, we're happy we've had a lot more good ones than not so good ones. Absolutely. I'm with you on that one. Andy, I appreciate your time today. Today was awesome. Story time with you is fantastic, by the way. Uh, and I'm really excited for Friday night. Like I said, I'm going as a fan. I just want to be in the crowd. I want to be with the people. I'm really excited for it. I know the Heat Nation is as well. I know everyone in the organization is as well. And I'm excited to see that that jersey go to the rafters and see it forever up there. It's going to be a glorious moment for all Heat fans out there and for you guys as well. So thank you for that. Thank you for your time today. You got it, my friend. Have a great, uh, great day, and uh, let's have a great time Friday night. Absolutely. Andy Ellisberg, Executive Vice President of Basketball Operations, Heat Lifer, joining me here in a special edition of Crancis Corner talking about Udonis Haslam.